Hi folks, Tormach Maintenance. Let's talk about how to adjust our x-axis gib and our x-axis angular contact bearing. Yes, there's still going to be some element of feel, but we're gonna introduce a torque tool to help us understand how to do this consistently and scientifically. And what's exciting to me about this is you need to adjust your gibs. You need to check this every so often, six months, a year, because things do wear and making sure these are set correctly is gonna help you get the most out of your machine, out of surface finishes and out of tool life. Let's dive in. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. What I want you to walk away with from this video is not only the actual recipe on how to fix this, but a better understanding of how these machines are built. I got really into this in the two Richard King scraping and machine rebuilding classes that I've taken. And once you understand it, it's really not that bad. So the first thing we're gonna do is look at the current state of the machine and its lost motion. And then we're gonna start taking some things apart and adjusting. Card here to the process and the recipe that we went through as well as some of the tools that we're using. That's really important because I guarantee you I will continue to change and improve this as I can. And a special shout out to Robert Sikowski, who was a huge influencer in helping me get to where I am on this, including the pulley tool and the torque tool you're about to see. We've got an indicator preloaded to zero at the end of our x-axis. I've zeroed my x-axis DRO and I'm in one thousandth of an inch step mode. So what I wanna show here and demonstrate is what's called lost motion. I'm gonna jog this machine. One, two, three, four. We don't have any movement in the table until I get to four thousandths of an inch. So what happened there? Well, I know the gib is too tight because I forced it to be too tight. But there's a couple of different things that can cause what's called lost motion. Basically, I'm rotating the stepper motor. That should turn the ball screw the ball screw will act inside the nut and that should move the table along the x-axis. By shoving that gib in too far right now or over tightening it, I've caused there to be too much friction and thus the machine is actually kind of winding up like a spring. Literally, I'm turning the screw, that's still happening. I'm putting full pressure on that nut, but the table doesn't want to give yet because that gib is too tight. And there's a couple of different ways a gib can be too tight. It could be seated too far, or the backside screw of the gib that's really just to kind of supposed to lock it in place could be over tightened, causing the gib to bow, also making it too tight. This test is really helpful as part of being a de detective because that's what this whole process is. It's kind of being smart and building a picture of what's going on at the machine. It's not necessarily mandatory like the, some of the tests that we're going to do here to really start adjusting and evaluating. What I'm gonna do now is loosen the gib and we're gonna take a look at how much table rock there is. Now we're gonna loosen the gib and on an 1100, that means scooting it from the right side to the left side or toward this camera. Loosen this left side screw 10 or 15 turns. You know, we're gonna really get that gib out of play. Now before I use the right side screw to drive that gib to the loose side, I'm gonna just jog the machine a little bit. That helps loosen that gib up. While I've got the screw in there, if you jog the machine a little, you'll see that that gib will loosen up more. Now we're gonna use the same indicator. This time we're gonna put it on the front of our table. I really recommend the Noga mag base that has the adjustment in the base. We've got it on sheet metal here. Not a good solution for metrology, but it's fine here so long as we don't bump the sheet metal with our waist. And I also really recommend a card here to our metrology tips and tricks video. One of the things that we want to pay attention to, especially when we're trying to understand absolute or relative movement, is the dial test indicator needle position relative to the surface and trying to keep it parallel. So I've got the indicator here. I'm going to preload it to zero. And I'm going to show that because we've taken that gib and we've loosened it, we've moved it to the left, and that wedge is no longer giving us that precision fit that gives us the rigidity of a machine that also can move. We should be able to rock this table. There we go. So I've got 
about uh, six or seven thousandths of rock in the table. When you're doing this test, you either need to put an indicator also on the saddle of the machine or actually tighten up your y-axis gib because this measurement will give you a different reading if you've got looseness or slop in your y-axis gib, which allows the whole table to twist on that y-axis saddle as well. Now keep in mind that's way out here to the side and everything flexes. So even when the gib is set properly, we'll probably be able to influence that some amount. But here I'm just trying to show again that by loosening that gib, we've allowed the machine to flex a little bit. Now with the gib out of play, let's go take a look at lost motion again. We've got our axis zeroed, jogging in thousands increments. Now take a look, one, two, three, four, five, we're at five thousandths, one, two, three, four, five. We're back to zero. There's no lost motion. Now you can see why that's really important when it comes to machining parts. We don't want, especially something like surfacing or anything where we're changing axis directions, we don't want lost motion. Four millimeter wrench. I like to use a regular style just to loosen the screw at first. And then you can switch to a ball uh, and having it on a longer T-handle makes it nice to get it loose and then you can get them out much quicker. Screws need to go into baggies. Three millimeter driver. We're gonna loosen the left two screws on this coupling. Now these may be tight, so again, use a square driver, Allen key, and make sure it's fully seated. You don't wanna strip these screws. If you even come close to starting to, replace them with new ones. You can also jog your machine to get the presentation of the screw the most convenient. They don't need to come out, just loosen, and now we can slide that stepper off be careful about it and I've got a piece of cardboard here just to set it down. It's okay for them to be warm. Stepper motors run hot even when they're not being uh, driven. Keep your tools handy because we're going to put in our pulley. This is from the Wednesday widget on making this device which is again shout out to Robert nothing short of genius for its simplicity and doing this scientifically and not by feel. They don't need to be too tight just snug. Time out. Where are we at? I've loosened the gib. We haven't adjusted the angular contact bearings. If you're still wondering what the heck are those, stay tuned. And we've added that pulley. One of the things that is nice about this is we are able to now feel the machine. Now my goal with this video is to use more science and less feel because science is awesome and it gives us repeatable values like torque numbers to look at and aim for and tell us what's going on. Nevertheless, feel is awesome. And you can see right now that I'm able to easily rotate this machine. Now that doesn't really tell us that much because the gib is loose. So there's not a lot of friction build up in the system uh, right now and we really couldn't machine like this because the table would chatter all over the place because that gib is loose. But what I want to do now is take a look at the angular contact bearings. So what are those? Let's play pretend. We've got the ball screw in our machine, we've got the ball nut, and then we've got our motor that drives the axis. These two are coupled together. There's no coupler here, but you get the idea. And when the motor turns, it turns our ball screw and that changes the position of the nut left to right. The table that we're looking at here is fastened to this ball nut and that's what causes our x-axis motion to occur. So what are the angular contact bearings? The angular contact bearings live on the left side of our ball screw and they preload this whole ball screw shaft. That way, when we start to rotate this screw, it's gonna look for the path of least resistance. And if there's any slop in the position of how this screw is mounted, that's gonna move, which could cause our table to bounce a little bit back and forth. So we wanna preload that bearing or angular contact bearing. So how do we preload it? Let's take a look. So these two nuts are what we use to adjust the angular contact bearings. They're not actually the angular contact bearings. It's really this nut right here that we tighten that compresses the stack of bearings. And then this nut right here backs up that nut to keep it from adjusting itself after we get it where we want it. So while we've got them set correctly, now this is what I call an optional measurement in our workflow of adjustments. But what we can do is establish the baseline. Where were we at? 
before we start loosening these, which is what I'm going to recommend that you do, we can take our fish scale, we can hook on, and we can start seeing what torque value we get. So I'm at about 300 grams, and what that gives me is a baseline. What are we at right now? Because next we're gonna loosen up and take off the preload from the angular contact bearing, and I wanna see what that value is. So before we loosen the angular contact bearing preload, take a look. As I rotate this, I can see the indicator move, and I'm getting kind of like a one-to-one. -one. There's no slop or backlash. As I move this, I get indicator movement. Great, hold on. Take the spanner wrench. Loosen those two nuts. And now take a look. Look at all that slop I've got. Good, so we're gonna re-preload that angular contact bearing. But before we do that, let's take a quick look at what the unpreloaded torque value is. So about 250, maybe about 250 grams. I was able to loosen those by hand with the tool. When we first started working on this machine, they were on there more snug. I couldn't get them off by just hand. So we used a set of vice grips around the shank of our tool, and that let us hold it in place while we used the spanner wrench to again, first loosen up the backing nut and then the actual nut itself. So now we're ready to set the preload on the angular contact bearing. So don't worry about the nut on the left. All we care about is the nut on the right. And we're gonna start snugging that up, taking measurements of the torque. How much do we preload? Let's take a look at the Tormach manual. Too little preload and we're gonna have slop. Too much preload though, you're gonna put a lot of unnecessary stress on the machine and that will result in premature wear in the bearings. So we went to 400, let's increase it just a little more. The goal we're gonna look for today is just to bring it up enough to again, minimize that slop, make sure we get one-to-one -one motion. So when I jog 5,000s, I get 5,000s. And what we saw in playing around was that something like 15 or so incremental ounce inches of preload. So with no re-preload, we were maybe 250 grams or eight ounce inches. To increase that by 15, will bring us to something like 700 or so grams. So the good news is that torque value stayed pretty consistent as we traveled the full machine length. And I would expect that with the bearing preload, there really shouldn't be uh, changes like there may well be uh, with the gib. And that's what happens is people will so often leave their vise right in the center of the machine for months or years. And what happens is that all the work happens in that area and you're gonna wear it unevenly. This has been a factor of machine tools since machine tools were started being built was try to wear them evenly. It makes for a much better situation. The other comment that's worth noting here is that we've got the table all the way to one side now, and you are going to start to see some amount of deflection. Everything has to have some clearance for there to be mechanical sliding surfaces. Right here, it's actually a lot worse because I don't have the gib tightened, so the table's gonna sag a little bit more. But this is one reason why I generally encourage folks not to permanently mount things like their uh, rapid turn or their fourth axis all the way off cantilevered all the way over here, you're gonna wear your machine unnecessarily. Now, if that's what you wanna do, it's your machine. I can't tell you not to, but at least be aware that there is a consequence to doing that. So now let's set the gib. Now this is tricky because we've got to tighten up this backing nut without influencing the preload on the first nut. So I'm gonna just finger tighten it there for a second. And then what I can do, I wanna watch that nut I'm looking to see the nut relative to the piece of steel in front of it. And it is gonna to start to move on us as soon as we get snug. So now I'll rotate and I'll tr get this in here. Like I said, this is the tricky part. That might be handy. You can almost hold it in place while you get the next one situated and then you can bring them together. And now we'll use our fish scale to see if we influence it and if we need to back it off or adjust. First try after we secured the backing nut, 600 grams. So it went down just a hair when we tried to adjust those two nuts in. Let's put the stepper back on though and see where we're at with lost motion. So let's check to see how our angular contact bearing preload is. 
We've got an indicator. I'll preload that. Lots of the word preload here. Um, preload that to zero. And again, you always want to put your indicator onto the most stable surface possible. I've got it on the sheet metal here. So don't lean on it, but in its free state here, I'm okay with it. I'll zero my DRO. I'm jogging in 1,000th increments in step move. And what I'm looking for is to make it one to one. So as I go one, two, three, four, five, I'm at five thou on the indicator. One, two, three, four, five, I'm back to zero. The other way, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, back to zero. Great. That gives me the confidence to know that our angular contact bearing is not too loose. Now it could be too tight, but because we use that torque tool, I feel comfortable that it's not overly tightened or overly preloaded. Now we have to set the gib. So there's three things that I think you can kind of use or be aware of to set the gib. The number one is we know that when the gib is loose, we can rock the table or twist it in what's called the XY plane. So again, that table will kind of rotate because that dovetail is effectively missing. We pulled that dovetailed gib out and the table can twist. So what we could do is tighten the gib in until we see that deflection minimized. I don't really like doing that because it's easy to over tighten the gib and also we're never gonna get that to zero and that's not really what we care about. Well, you've got some other factors happening when you go to rock the table and push it at the end. The other way is we can go back to using our torque tool, start pushing that gib or driving that gib tighter and then use our torque tool to test it. The awesome thing about that is it's got that scientific approach and we know it's, a, it's two angled surfaces. So as that gib starts to tighten, you will see, uh, I don't know if it's technically exponential, but it's something exponential or logarithmic of an increase in the friction of the system. And you can see in the Tormach manual, they've got kind of that graphical representation. The downside is it takes a little bit longer. The other thing that we can do is go back to the beginning of this video and that idea of lost motion. I didn't really understand what that meant when they first said it, but right now we know we get one to one. I move the machine one thou, I get one thou of travel. Here's the thing, that's not always going to be one to one. Quick timeout folks, when I was watching the review of this video, I want to clarify that point. It's not always going to be one to one just when you either start moving the axis or switch directions because of the initial built up forces, the stiction and some other mechanical things going on. We will see it be one to one as soon as we've started the motion control or the movement of that axis every machine has some amount of stiction and other mechanical forces and guess what we have to deal with the reality of the laws of physics and there has to be some amount of slop in any machine and i want you guys to understand that better so what i want to do is have the machine as tight as i can but also when i tell the motor to move it turns that turns the screw the screw actuates on the nut and the nut slides that table there is always going to be some amount of stiction force that's gonna cause that screw in the machine to kind of wind up like a spring. So you're gonna create some increase in tension and then the machine's gonna pop loose. Now we're talking about tiny amounts here, but when we've got these amazing metrology tools, we can kind of measure that and see that. So I'm gonna use the torque tool. We're gonna to start increasing the gib. It'll take a few minutes. It's probably a little bit slower to do it this way, but let's see what those numbers, the scientific value comes out at. Since I'm tightening the gib only right now, I'm going to take the right hand screw out and totally out of play because I just want to be driving the left hand screw in. When we're done and we need to set the gib, we'll put that right hand screw back in. So the first reading that we took after we started to seat that gib, the torque value increased from 600 to about 850. The other thing you can do here is use your feel. Yes, I love the scientific approach of the torque values, but this is no different than a Bridgeport machine where you can understand and feel your hand is a proxy for that motor. How hard does that motor have to work to overcome? Does the table feel tight? You'll know if it feels too tight. Second pull after adjusting that gib, we tightened up the gib a little more and we're now at a thousand grams. So this is great. We're seeing that increase as we start to seat the gib. The thing I like about how this feels right now, when I start to turn it, it feels snug, but it does move freely versus when that gib is too tight, you really have to start to turn that pulley before you start to feel the machine break free. So I think I like the feel of the gib, but let's put some numbers behind that feel. And so this is gonna go back to that lost motion. And one of the reasons I don't like the words lost motion and backlash is they're almost opposite. When I go to a bridge port with backlash, that's usually because it's worn out and it's got slop. 
Here we're looking for lost motion. That really means the machine is too tight. So you're giving it a commanded move and it's literally seized up. It's like, I don't want to do that move unless you increase the amount of pressure on the nut and that causes it to then pop through. So we switched to a more stable platform. Now I've got an indicator mounted on the table against the spindle. We've stepped up to a one ten thousandths of an inch indicator. Way, way better. Again, goes back to the metrology tips and tricks. Big difference in the quality of indicator and the degree of accuracy to it. Let's preload it to zero. That's what I like about the no-go that have the adjustment in the bases. It's almost impossible to do this in the head because they're just so sensitive. Okay, so we're at zero. I'll zero out my X. We're stepping in one ten thousandth of an inch. So let's look at what happens. One, two, three, four. So it took until the fourth move to get a full tick. We had a little bit of motion in the one, two, three. Now these are ten thousandths of an inch. So this is insane. Now let's see if we get full motion. Let's see, I'm on four. Yeah. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12. So it took me between 11 and 12 tenths to get to, um, to get to between uh, about a thousandth of an inch. So that would, to me, uh, show that there's about one to two tenths of lost motion, which is excellent. In fact, maybe we could tighten that give up a little. Let's go back the other way. So again, the first three should be fractional moves, and that's what we're looking for. I want the consistency you got to be a detective and make sure you're analyzing the right thing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Different answer. That took 18 to get back. So let's see if we have truly eight tenths. So zeroed out. I may have started that first move with some of the preload taken out, which just was my fault. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Let's see if eighteen gets me back. I'm not even gonna look. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. We're on zero. So we have eight tenths of lost motion in this machine due to the stiction and gib force. That's great. I'm okay with that. You can go look at your Tormach manual to kind of reconcile this with what are the machine specifications, what are its capabilities. And it, I will tell you, it is really easy to want to get hung up with some of these numbers. We're here to make parts. I want to get the most out of the machine. I want to maximize service finishes. I want to maximize tool life. There has to be some amount of give in this machine. That's something that I didn't understand when I started this, and I think some people struggle with too. They expect this thing to be totally seized up and perfectly locked and rigid until it's able to move. Well, for it to move, it has to have some amount of slop. And that's why, hopefully, after watching this video, you have a better understanding, at least in the x-axis, of how that mechanical system works. It's actually pretty cool. So what's next? For us, we're going to check the y-axis. Actually, same thing. Uh, the difference is that your gib is obviously along the y-axis. Relatively easy. I don't think that really warrants a new video. Then we're going to talk about the head, and that gets a lot more complicated. There's a lot more going on, including the gib and including the weight of the head and how we analyze and making sure we're diagnosing it the correct thing. So look for that video later. Otherwise, folks, hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.